Um, so just to set the context, you know, buy now, pay later loans, which is what we're going to focus on in today's discussion, are, you know, and the retail side of it, are basically these short-term installment loans that are offered by retailers at the point of sale, um, often with a down payment, uh, due at purchase, and then a fixed repayment schedule. Um, and they have somewhat lenient lending terms in, in most cases, minimal underwriting uh, and low or no interest. In most cases, because um, we'll, come, we'll see examples of how it, it's playing out in emerging market context. Um, now, we know that there's a massive demand for unsecured short-term loans globally. And BNPL is one of those products that we have to watch carefully because statistics indicate that the, it's growing pretty rapidly, particularly in the e-commerce segment. Um, at a global level, you know, we saw about $97 billion. Is that, I mean, you might have a more updated statistic, but in 2021, at least, that was the number, and it's expected to, I think, double by 2025. Um, and it's, it's also a really relevant topic because the Bank for International Settlements just released a report yesterday, so this is clearly on everybody's mind. Um, and according to them, most of the consumers that borrow or take BNPL products are typically younger, have less education, have higher debt, lower credit scores, and higher delinquency rate. Now, what we don't know as a community that thinks about inclusive finance is how these non-traditional borrowing options are altering the portfolio of consumers. And I think that's something to particularly think about, both at this panel and beyond. Um, we do have some evidence emerging, though. We know that in the UK, there's been recent research that's been done by the Money and Mental Health Institute, and they found that one in 10 people are planning to use buy now, pay later for their Christmas shopping. And this is a context where the UK, just like several other countries, is facing high cost of living, is facing high amount of pressure that consumers uh, face in, in terms of you know, managing their expenses. On the other hand, in Mexico, which is one of the fastest growing markets and where 80% of the population does not have access to credit cards, we're finding some positive evidence Anecdotally, at least, you know, we've heard that in the summer when Mexico faced extreme heat, um, several low-income consumers did take BNPL products to buy fans, which helped them, you know, cope with the, with the extreme heat situation. Now, that's anecdotal, so we don't know what the, and hopefully, you know, we'll hear more of that. But with that, I'd like to introduce the speakers for today. I'm delighted because this is a wonderful panel, which has regulator perspective, emerging mass market perspective, consumer voice from advanced markets, and a BNPL provider. So this is quite unique. Um, so uh, starting with our virtual panelists, we have Delicia Hand, who's the Director of Financial Fairness Advocacy Consumer Reports. Um, Juan Carlos Izaguerre, who's, uh, who I've worked with a lot and who's been a mentor in my, in my professional career, so I'm delighted to have you here, who's a senior financial sector specialist at SIGA. Um, Max Merck, who's the director general of Tech Check Mexico, uh, and Flora Coleman, who's global director of policy and government relations, Krana. So welcome to all of you. And Delicia, I want to start with you, um, and thank you again for joining at such an early hour. Um, consumer Reports is one of the initial 10 consumer international member signatories to a statement calling for effective regulation on BNPL, and you signed this last year at the World Consumer Rights Day, in 2022, actually. Um, and what are some of the emerging risks that you have seen in the context of BNPL services? And perhaps you could provide instances where Consumer Reports has played a pivotal role in addressing consumer concerns? Sure, thank you so much, um, Jay Shree. So our own research shows that in the US more than 80% of consumers use at least one FinTech app with the average consumer using four different apps to manage their financial lives. And this year we've launched an initiative where we are specifically evaluating digital financial apps, the most popular apps. We started with payment apps. Um, by now pay later apps and are now um, assessing mobile banking apps. Um, in the research we did and the testing we did last year, um, we saw that uh, by now pay later app usage grew in the US marketplace by much as 50%. And our own re recent research confirms that that trajectory um, is still there. 
Um, consumers are quite active in the space. Um, we evaluated eight of the most popular apps in the U.S. marketplace, um, the different business models, and um, we did so along seven dimensions, um, privacy, safety, transparency. Um, we are also looking at user centricity, financial well-being, inclusivity, and environmental social governance. Um, for the first couple of evaluation, we really focused on safety, privacy, and transparency. Um, and we use a variety of approaches. We do product testing. This involves document review, user interface review with our testers actually onboarding and using uh, the apps, and then a number of technical tests, um, network traffic analysis, static analysis, and other kind of wonky data um, software base pass alongside consumer research. Um, and we recently re released two reports, um, results of our testing in May this year, and then a policy report in July, which revealed the results of um, our, our testing. Uh, high level, we see um, some concerns, re company security practices, uh, over collection and use of consumer information beyond what's necessary to use a service. And then in terms of some of the emerging risks um, to consumers, um, the service is often advertised and this came, this was probably the strongest thing we saw in our uh, consumer research with actual users of buy now, pay later products um, that they are offered as free, but they're not entirely, um, that they that might not be the case through the duration of um, their, their use. Um, we saw um, lots of advertisements and consumers responding to the adverts um, as these products having no fees, no interest, but then the reality as the consumer goes through the process and makes a purchase can be more complicated. A consumer could in initially choose a zero interest pay in for loan option, but then decide that maybe six payments is more suitable and not realizing that the six payment plan is subject to, to interest and different companies provide different interfaces and different um disclosures. So consumers moving and working with many different providers, um, that can also add to the, the confusion. Um, we also think that there's a risk to um, overall financial well-being, um, that consumers may be at a risk of uh, overextension, um, given that they're a varied practice in assessing consumer ability to repay. Um, many consumers um, end up in a um, loan stacking situation, or at least the consumers that were part of our research, many of them um, had at least four or more um, buy now, pay later loans. And so when these multiple auto payments for um, the plans hit the bank accounts, consumer bank accounts all at once, there's you know a risk again of consumers accounts getting depleted uh, too fast. Um, and then I think additionally, um, we see impacts on credit scores. While we know that many buy now, pay later companies, many of the companies we assess um, do report um, or provide flexibility. Uh, they may report positive payments. Um, these may not be having the impacts on consumer credit scores that um, is intended. So those are some of the things that we are looking to see um, some shifts in the, the policy space. I will note that in our approach, one of the things that we do is to um, work with the providers of, of the company, companies that we evaluate and share the results of our assessment. And in many cases, uh, many companies agreed to make modest shifts um, in certain policies and practices. So um, the, the focus of our work is not just to do the research and to put the results out there, but to also then work with companies to improve practices. I do want to come back to you uh, to understand, you know, when we get into the regulation, and I, I do want to get into challenges that you might have faced in the U.S. context, um, because regulation can be 
split between various states and how they classify BNPL. But, you know, I'll, I'll just come to that. Um, meanwhile, I want to turn to Max, because Mexico is one of the fastest growing markets as far as BNPL is concerned. And I think the statistics say that it's expected to grow over 52% um, over the next few years. And you work on consumer empowerment initiatives. So from your point of view, um, first of all, what are you seeing in the Mexican context? And how is the BNPL model perhaps different from what we see in other parts of the world um, and risks? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having us. And uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to travel from Mexico City to Nairobi. As you can imagine, uh, we are a German-Mexican team. So we tried all kinds of foods, and we will try, obviously, many beers uh, this evening. Um, so now coming back to the serious topic. Um, first of all, you mentioned uh, this sharp increase mm -hmm. in these kind of schemes, but at the same time in Mexico, the digital economy only increases by 3 to 5 percent. So that as an economist, we already can conclude that there's more and more uh, use and concentration um, of, of different providers, uh, but also there's obviously a need by Mexicans for these kind of buy now, pay later schemes. No? Uh, in a general context, uh, in, in the case of Mexico, uh, we would be, we would even say that there is nearly clear, complete anarchy uh, in that kind of sector, uh, because all the rules um, and laws have been defined by private sector interests, as there has been no, no participation of civil society uh, or even experts on that topic. Um, and this brings us in Mexico to providers uh, who actually charge interest rates uh, of 80, 90 percent, which would be completely illegal in most of these countries where we come from. Um, but they can do that in Mexico. And to uh, give you another idea, we have still providers, commercial large retailers as well as credit loan providers who knock at your door if you do not fulfill payment. Uh, and this happens especially in the most vulnerable regions in Mexico. That doesn't happen in Mexico City. It happens in Chiapas, it happens in Chihuahua in the north. Um, and we finally also got, as TechCheck, a, a reply to our request to the national authorities, CONDUCEF, on how many requests for clarification banks receive in Mexico. So and just to give you an idea, last year there were more than 5 million requests for clarification of unknown transactions in our bank account statements in Mexico. And this is the regulated commercial part. Uh, and we have similar numbers for the unregulated, no, not unregulated, it is regulated now in Mexico, but not commercial part, which is especially applies for fintech companies. Um, so what we are very worried about in Mexico, and then I come also to the solution and what we do, uh, is especially the young consumers who now started their, let's say, credit journey during the pandemic. Um, they, have, they immediately face these kind of offers of buy now, pay later, um, and so they have the option to buy the computer, to buy the TV, uh, and have no, sorry to say, that idea what are the implications at the end of the day. And the implication can be that someone knocks at your door. Uh, and this is not only that they force you then to uh, fulfill the payment or even uh, rent your laundry, uh, but it's also a social stigma that we are very much worried about in Mexico as well at this stage. Um, what I also, at the end, uh, want to emphasize is that in Mexico, like these kind of pay now, uh, buy now, pay later schemes, are of, often include interest rate payments. So it's not for free. Yeah, uh, during commercial events like Black Friday, uh, retailers offer no interest, um, but other commercial retailers usually charge you interest if you buy now and then pay later. Uh, and these are commercial retailers who have their own banking system or credit cards, commercial credit cards, and then they charge you later 50, 60 percent if you do not fulfill a payment. Uh, and there's no snooze, no, no, they do not give you a chance not to pay at that stage. Um, and so what we need in Mexico is clear advocacy uh, for clear and transparent rules. Uh, and these 
rules need to be as simple as possible. Uh, we, as part of the civil society and also uh, academic experts, need to join these kind of discussions in Mexico because it has been dominated, unfortunately, by private sector interests. Uh, and it is no surprise that for commercial banks in Mexico, it, they have the highest margin in the world. The same bank like Scotiabank in Canada or Santander in Spain, they do behave well and offer good services, but in Mexico you still have to pay for a financial transaction. So if I go to one bank and then I pay to another bank, I still have to pay a fee. We're at this kind of level still in Mexico. So there's a lot of options to improve. We obviously need uh, programs for educating young consumers, especially on how interest rates work, for example. Uh, how these payment schemes work. Uh, we do not have in Mexico any kind of platform for comparison uh, of different uh, options. So if the big retailer A only offers the following providers, we have to use these kind of providers and we cannot compare uh, with other payment schemes uh, from a different provider. And I want to finish my, my, my comments from uh, our beloved Mexico here, we have a serious problem with influencers making advertisement for these kind of payment schemes. Uh, a concrete example, now one provider called Cusquipay joined the biggest commercial event in Mexico uh, and it ran a campaign with influencers, with the biggest influencers in Mexico uh, to say, well, it is trustful, you can use these kind of schemes. At, at the end of the day, we have thousands of young kids uh, who I completely understand want to buy their new sneakers or want to buy their new TV, end up in a, in a debt scheme uh, that it will be very difficult for them um, to come out. Full stop. Thank you. That's, that's a lot to process, but thank you for that. And it's, I, I think all of these are things that I'm going to channel into questions for you, Juan Carlos, at some point, so just giving you a heads up. Um, but Flora, turning to you, because you know, obviously we just heard the consumer voice perspective, something that we heard from Delicia earlier is the fact that people are not really improving their credit scores by repaying BNPL loans. Uh, now, we were chatting earlier, and you said that there's even a shift in the demographic so perhaps we could start with that and what you're seeing from a provider perspective um, and maybe, you know, what is that indicating in terms of, you know, what the product itself is doing for people, who, what are, what are the segments that we really need to think about beyond the young um, and maybe we can move from there. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think there we go, I'm on. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. This is such a pleasure to be able to participate in such a valuable discussion. Um, I just wanted to quickly give an update because Klarna doesn't operate in most markets yeah. that many attendees are from. So just I give a gentle overview. Um, we are AI powered global payments network um, with a shopping um, assistant as well. And what's not known by many people is that um, a third of payments made via Klarna services are people paying with money they have, so there's no credit involved. So we have a kind of a broader perspective, but BNPL is one of the, um, is 60% of our payments. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview about why we think BNPL is so important, because it's a a fair alternative to high cost credit and and that's really borne out in the in the information that we've been able to gather so for example in Europe 66% of consumers own a credit card in the EU and 66% of those do not know what their APR is. And that is setting aside, obviously, the difficulty that I personally face with even the usability of an APR. Um, whereas when you look at Klarna, which is an interest-free BNPL product, unlike some of the providers noted, um, 96% of Klarna EU consumers understand when their payments are due and how much that payment will be, which is really, really high. And I think that's borne out by the fact that our default rates are less than 1%, which is 30 to 40% lower than traditional credit. And we've been able to do this whilst growing our customer base to now 150 million global active consumers and also um, maintaining profitability as a business. So. Hopefully, we are breaking the mold um, and offering a fair alternative to traditional credit. Specifically, to look at the demographics, and, and yes, it's very interesting to see that shift in the perceptions, as we saw in the BIS report from this week, that 
traditionally BNPL is seen to be a preserve of the young, a preserve of the economically excluded, perhaps you don't have access to traditional credit. We've seen a huge shift in those demographics. Um, so now the fastest growing segment is 58 year olds plus. Um, so the boomer generation and above. Um, the most, one of the most popular products in the last, in the black week um, sales was actually a leaf blower, um, which is not what you typically think is being bought by you know, young, lower economic um, people. So there's been a big shift over the last few years, and you know, you asked me to give a bit of a sense of where we think that's coming from. Obviously, I think we can all possibly guess, but one of the major things is in times of economic recession, times of economic challenge, people are more likely to look at ways to save money, and particularly higher income segments, older segments are more likely to look at alternative products, whereas traditionally it's mostly been the preserve of younger consumers. But also, you know, these fintechs have been around, BNPL has been around a long time. We were actually founded in 2000 and. Um, 2007 and we became a bank in 2014 in Sweden so these BNPL providers like Klarna have been around for a very long time and, and actually it's because everybody's seeing that that opportunity of saving money, saving time and worrying less about your finances is something that really makes sense for them. Can I stay with you for a second and have you answer or explain how you make your money because you don't charge interest? What's your operating model? Yeah, absolutely. So it's very simple. We form partnerships with retailers and they pay a small percentage fee in the same way that they would do when they offer a credit card payment. Um, and so, yeah, we're very proud to not make our money off customer interest. We think it's very important. Our founder, Sebastian Simikowski, founded um, the business partly because of a need for his family and his upbringing to get away from problem debt. In Sweden, there is a huge problem of over-indebtedness where we were founded. And it's one of the reasons why I joined and work at Klarna is the fact that we are making consumer goods available and affordable. So, for example, if you're, you know, I've got a 16-month-old son and, you know, you're looking at buying a pack of nappies for them, the ability to buy the jumbo pack means that you can save about a third on that retail price, which is mostly being made available through these BNPL products in, you know, versus traditional credit where you, like I did when I was younger, get stuck into revolving credit, paying only the minimum payment and ending up with balances averaging around $6,000 now in the US versus $150 is the average outstanding balance. I also wanted to say one of the interesting things as well about um, Klarna and BNPL is that it's not even, you know, traditional loans, you might be penalized for paying them off early. Um, Certainly, that's the case for many of your kind of car finance and home finance loans. With Klarna, we actually have 32% of US consumers are paying us off in advance of the payment terms being due, and that goes up to 62% in Germany. So that's at no penalty. You can make those payments at the time that works for you, really allowing people to manage their money. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go way off script here. because. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to ask Juan Carlos the last question before we jump to audience questions. But Juan Carlos, you know, here's a great product from, you know, Sweden's point of view. Worked brilliantly, you know, is probably appropriate culturally, you know, it, it matches what people have been doing all the time. You take it to another context and it's not regulated. Here's a problem that we're seeing with... Um, you know, with, with Mexico and other emerging markets. First of all, who's the regulator? And, you know, this is a story that's repeating itself, which is same problems of over-indebtedness, uh, problems of poor collection practices. This is something we've seen over and over and over again. Uh, so first, who should regulate? And second, it, from a supervisor's point of view, because you've played that role many times, um, what is the kind of market data even that should be made available so that people can take steps to make this more responsible? Well, number one, thank you for this invitation. This is a pleasure being in the Congress. 
uh, and being in Ainori for the first time with great food last night and even some dancing, so it was great. Uh, now to the serious question on the regulator. I think it depends on the context. It depends on the legal mandate that may exist in different countries. In some countries, the central bank actually does have a mandate, a consumer protection mandate to look at credit institutions. When that's the case, BNPL should be considered, uh, in my opinion, as a credit product, even if there's not interest being charged in some cases, but it's, it's an offering of a, of a facility. So as such, should be part of whatever authority has a mandate for credit providers. In a couple of countries, there is a national credit regulator. So OK, that's fine. That works. When there is not a clear financial sector authority behind credit-only institutions, we still have general consumer protection authorities, which should always look at credit-only institutions, microfinance institutions, finance companies, or BNPL providers. So, but the main point that this is a topic CGAP and we've been emphasizing for a long time is that there should always be an authority from a consumer protection standpoint behind those who offer a financial service to the consumers. Now, in terms of, of your other question, what type of data cons uh, supervisors may use? I think there's a, there's a suite of data that they can use and that they should use. And we can differentiate, uh, I would say, three types of data. First one that I would suggest is having consumer survey data. And that's an interesting one because you can really understand how consumers are using the product, for which purposes, and how they are repaying, whether they are repaying. And, so, and even if they repay on time or not, by having consumer survey data, you're looking at a consumer perspective and their use of data, which sometimes it's difficult for supervisors to gather that data through provider data, because they cannot consolidate all that data directly through the information of their supervised entities. So that's number one. Number two, for those entities that are under the remit, uh, I would thoroughly suggest to do analysis of transactional data, of really granular data. Uh, on top of regulatory reports, which are like the monthly reports that they receive from the supervised entities. But granular data means looking at the portfolio data of uh, the BNPL providers and really looking at what are the, the trends mm. uh, on lack of repayment. That, by looking at granular data, you can, say, you can see how many days that consumers is late in repaying, if that's the case, uh, how much they have actually paid for fees, for not, penalty fees, for whatever reason, and if there is interest, if how much they have paid in actual. No, but also, at what times of the day they may be requesting some of these products, and if they for example, request a type of product at a certain time of the day or certain days of the month, whether they may be riskier if they do so. Because sometimes risky behavior can be, under, can be unveiled through granular data and risky type of, of, of consumer situations. The third type of data that may be not the, the priority but useful too for non-regulated entities is looking at social media. Because complaints may be appearing in social media rather than in other mechanisms. So and, and the supervisor may want to, to get an idea of what are the main types of complaints that consumers are posting in social media. This is an exercise that we did uh, on, on digital credit in India, and we were able to see what were the main types of consumer complaints in social media posts. And for example, the main issues were aggressive debt collection practices and misleading advertising and fraudulent issues. So, but that was no data 
available through any other mechanism. So by looking at social media, the Reserve Bank Innovation Hub in India was able to understand better what, kind, what were the kind of issues that were appearing in the market and being informed through, through that mechanism. Uh, I, mean, I particularly enjoyed the social media research, but can I just say that as a researcher, I'm extremely frustrated by the decline of Twitter. The fact that social media is now so fragmented that there's just no way for me to get a consolidated you know, piece of data. But yeah, that's a separate event. Um, I'm going to open up to audience questions in case anybody, yes, I see a hand up there. Thank you. I wanted to ask about regulation of buy now, pay later, and how, particularly from an advocate's point of view, whether you think it needs to be regulated like credit and some of the gaps you see. And specifically, specifically for Klarna, um, I note that you charge businesses um, as part of your business model. That's regulated in Australia for credit providers, but not buy now, pay later, because it adds cost to the system, which then gets passed on to consumers. So I guess, how much are your fees compared to what credit providers charge, and do you think it should be regulated? Um, okay, I'm happy to kick off. Um, so um, the, the fees that we, we charge vary by market and vary by the provider. I can't go into the, the depth of that. But what I can say is that where there is a, it's a viable competitive offering, they get to choose whether to partner with Klarna, they get to choose whether to partner with, offer Amex payments, um, offer you know, BNPL with another provider. So it's very, very competitive. And actually, um, in, some, in our home market in Sweden, where there's very effective open banking, we are lower than, um, we are lower than traditional credit cards and, um, as a payment and more akin to a debit card payment in terms of a cost. So they're good functioning markets. And just on that, it's actually one of the reasons why I joined Klarna. One of my personal um, big, big beliefs is that we need to drive down the cost of payments. And in markets where there aren't alternative payment rails, they're not working effectively. Regulation has not worked effectively to bring down the cost of payments in the US and in the EU where there are not alternative payment rails. So that's one of the re reasons I actually joined Klarna is that we are delivering an alternative payment rail to hopefully drive down the cost of payments. And we can see that in certain markets. Um, in terms of regulation, I actually should have covered this off earlier on, but we are absolutely pro-regulation. And I think one of the major reasons why is precisely some of the research and commentary that we've had, both from Consumer Reports, BIS, the rest of the panel, there is a lack of consistency for consumers. There is a lack of clarity. The, the idea that you might get moved from a pay in three, a pay in four plan onto a pay in six plan, and that has consequences for interest. I personally remember these from when I was taking out you know, in store finance, and it was billed as BNPL and then would shift quite quickly. So very, very pro-regulation because that will bring about cohesive standards. Where that regulation should sit is challenging because when done best, it does sit with credit holistically because there are a lot of measures that need to be looked at. You know, the Consumer Credit Directive in the EU has just been reformed and will finally come into force in 2025. We're in, involved in the final negotiations because it's at the member state level. But that wasn't looked at since the 70s. And things have changed so much, but also consumer understanding and consumers' needs. For example, you know, the specificity about disclosures that you might see in certain regulation, like in the US, that requires you to state things in certain way over certain mediums, is just not fit for purpose when you look at young consumers who don't want to engage. You know, we talked about this. They don't want to engage with terms and conditions, and they can't negotiate on terms and conditions. And most of us find that terms and conditions are something that's only useful when it goes wrong, um, as Christine mentioned yesterday. So we've, we've really got that opportunity to get it right. But having said that, we don't want it to be a blocker to speed. And sometimes trying to fix everything can be a challenge. So hopefully we're able to do both in parallel. Australia is actually moving to now regulate BNPL, moving from a code of conduct. Um, 
as I mentioned in the EU, the UK has also got proposals, there's been various codes of conducts and reviews, and we're gladly engaging on them and hope to see the regulation come through to make sure that everybody gets a fairer alternative to traditional credit and gets access to safe and affordable credit. Thank you. Um, any other comments on the regulation? Yes. <laughs> no, I think regulation is key. Uh, and there are, I would say, three at least areas where regulation could be quite important and powerful. Transparency, number one. It's, it's, it really needs to be clear for the consumer what the actual cost of the product is, uh, if there is a cost, of course, uh, but they, they need to understand what the, what the characteristic of the product is. But also in terms of suitability of the credit, I think there's some issues there in terms of how the product is designed, but also how the repayment plans may be uh, defaulted. Uh, and I would say I had experience. I had a BMPL a product recently in the US, two actually. And what was very curious is in one of them, the repayment plan was set up in such a manner that by the end of the period when you had no interest, you still had a, an amount of money left, mm -hmm. which meant that that amount would trigger the interest rate for the entire balance mm. of the credit. I had to do a whole calculation, right, to see what was the actual installment that I needed to pay monthly to cover the total payment plan that wouldn't charge me an interest rate. And I had to spend like several minutes to do that. I know finance. Put that into a lower income consumer. That, they won't do that. And they will think that the offer was made for them to put to finish paying that product without an interest rate because that's how the product was offered to them. So suitability there and transparency. And on suitability too, one, one extra point is, come on, a lot of people are going to do this on the spot, mm. right? Some of these PNPLs you're buying, you're really making the decision. And sometimes you have you go to several stores in one day, right, Thanksgiving or Black Friday, and you go and make decisions maybe at the same day. How many, how many decisions of your credit exposure you may be taking on a single day? Are you able to calculate how much you're going to pay on that total credit your next month? Not, right? So some kind of ability or trigger in terms of how many number of credits you may take on a single day and whether you may be authorized to receive that credit. If otherwise, you may be really getting far too many credits in a single day without being able to make that credit exposure decision by a customer. So something around that should be part of also the regulation, in my opinion. Delicia, I do want to turn to you because, uh, you know, on, on the regulation front, particularly in the U.S., it's, it's, cha it's challenging because of state-specific regulations and the way BNPL products themselves are categorized. And I do want to understand some of the challenges that you might be facing when lobbying or advocating for better BNPL um, regulation. Sure, thank you. I mean, you raise a really important point that by now pay later products, um, uh, we often, or just in general with respect to financial services in the U.S., it, there's a patchwork approach. Um, you have um, regulation and oversight at the state level, which can vary, and then at the federal level, the, the common trend tends to be sort of a low federal floor and then variation um, across the state. and. Um, and one of the things that we can see, literally can see it in the research and testing and the consumer experience is the, the then asymmetry um, that is experienced by the consumer by different approaches depending based on this patchwork. So depending on what approaches, how a company is categorized and you know whether they choose to follow, for example, one privacy pathway um, and offer and, and tether to state level requirements or interpret another day. There, there's just such a panoply of um, practices across the, the marketplace that really came through um, in our uh, evaluation. Um, at the state level, there are various 
uh, regulatory models. So um, some states have classified buy now, pay later as exempt from lending laws uh, through specific carves out, carve outs. So this, from our view, leaves um, buy now, pay later insufficiently regulated or unregulated at the state level. Um, states like California, for example, they will license and impose uh, various uh, consumer protection rules on buy now, pay later. Uh, they're they're um, categorized as credit service organizations. Um, but again, there, there are some gaps. Um, some states um, consider buy now, pay later as uh, direct lenders. Um, much like uh, installment loans, um, imposing different interest rates, or interest rate caps or, or fee limits. So um, one of the things that I think just, again, was highlighted in our research is then what are the consumer um, impacts of that, right? Because consumers are making payments cross borders, you know, um, cross jurisdictions and should not be subject to um, organizations, companies um, choosing which practices they're going to, to follow. Um, and, and this definitely shows up in the, the consumer experience. Um, so these are some, and this is just the state level. Um, at the federal level, we would want to see um, the imposition of, of uh, standards like treating by now pay later as credit or lending such that um, companies across the board would have to do an analysis of um, ability to repay and some of the is other issues that um, Juan Carlos mentioned. So it's quite problematic in the U.S. marketplace, in, in my opinion. And then this is um, augmented by just rapid innovation in the U.S. marketplace. The, the product offerings are continually changing. Um, companies are, are shifting various offerings. And so um, from a consumer perspective, it might be really, you can see the ways in which this just creates additional risk for consumers. Thank you, Delicia. I think we have one more audience question. Hi, um, I'm, Hong, I'm Michael from the Hong Kong Consumer Council. Um, just like to share our experience from what we've seen in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, now, under Hong Kong law, um, a money lender or a credit provider normally needs to obtain a license uh, to lend money. Um, now, the BNPL service providers, what they do is they don't structure this as a loan. Mm. They structure this as an assignment of debt from the uh, trader, from the seller, uh, to the service provider. So um, it's an assignment of debt situation, and in that case, they don't need a license at all, and effectively, they become unregulated. So that is something I wish to flesh out and um, see you know, what uh, the panelists would, would, would think. Um, and I know that this is not just in Hong Kong, it's um, in some other uh, Asia-Pacific jurisdictions as well. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, that's, um, I know that there, there's lots of expertise in this audience, particularly from you know, jurisdictions where BNPL regulation has provided um, some positive examples. So perhaps you know, there are people in the audience that want to share what's happening in Australia or the UK or uh, EU from what you've seen and best practices that we can amplify as the product obviously is spreading across the world. Anyone? <laughs> you're, you're by far the most advanced as far as BNPL regulation is concerned. <laughs> yeah, look, Australia, several of the buy now, pay later um, innovators started in our country, so it's been around for a long time and it's causing a lot of harm. Um, lots of people with multiple debts, like some speakers have talked about. They are going down a regulatory path, but it's not nearly as strong as consumer advocates want it to be. Um, in particular, the credit assessment piece is weak. Um, it won't be as clear, you know, it'll be hard for people, it, it's gonna be more likely that people will still have multiple loans, like you're talking about, and that's where the major harm comes from. And if I may jump in. Uh, just uh, comment on what you mentioned from Hong Kong. What we see also in Mexico that we do not have any kind of redress mechanism. Yeah. Um, and that comes also back to the question of regulation. So all these kind of providers want to offer their services online, but once you have a problem, 
uh, you do not know who to contact, at least in Mexico. I don't know, and I wouldn't even know in Germany who to contact. Mm. Um, and so I think it would be at least fair if you offer your services in the digital economy that you also offer and ensure online redress mechanisms uh, so that I, as a consumer, have a fair chance uh, to get a solution to the dispute that I might face. Uh, and I think for also it would be extremely important that we can cancel all these kind of payment schemes with no penalty. Um, so if I do have the money that I can pay up front, the $1,000 that I owe, and so that there's no penalty. What we see in Mexico that often these schemes, I don't know what it is like, if you pay early, then they actually charge you extra. So, uh, and then the last comment also, we, we had a talk this morning with one of the big online retailers in Mexico, and actually the good retailers have an interest of not using the uh, buy now, pay later scheme. So they would love to have more Mexicans with a credit card. They would love to have more Mexicans with access to the banking system so that they could pay immediately. Uh, and so there's no interest from the retailers, at least, to use these, and I'm not including you, uh, these kind of schemes that we see uh, in Mexico at this time. Um, yeah, I just wanted to... Apologies. Um, just a few suggestions that we've seen that we think can be effective. So um, the first is the question of not being able to direct complaints because the BNPL might be outside of the scope of existing regulation. The ombudsman's or adjudicators have to reject complaints. And so thinking about a way to allow financial complaints to go into an ombudsman, despite the fact that the product itself is not regulated, even if the provider, in Klarna's case, we have credit licenses in most US states and in the UK, most EU countries and are a bank, so just to clarify. Um, the other thing I think that would be helpful is to look at outcomes-based regulation. Singaporean regulator, UK regulator, every regulator I think has paid lip service to this saying that outcomes-based regulation is a useful thing, um, and it really, the power of outcomes-based regulation in financial services is it means that the fintech innovation can be used to innovate to find better outcomes for consumers and find proportionate controls that work for the types of people that are using them. So, as I said, our default rate has remained static at less than 1%, and that's a global default rate. Um, it can be lower in some markets, but whilst we've done that, we've maintained increasing our consumer base. Also, the average ticket value has stayed also very static, so not seeing an increase in loan amounts, but there taking on of more consumers whilst keeping default rates low is through innovations like, um, compared to traditional credit, we are making uh, as credit assessment decisions every time you make a purchase, whereas if you take out a credit card, you have a one-time assessment, and then that might be re-evaluated at any given moment, but may not happen for years, and you'll see that number, the balance that you're allowed creep up. Mine, you know, ended up at three, four times my income I was being given by credit card companies. Um, and we're looking at BNPL where the debt is $150 on average, the average balance. So really thinking about outcomes-based regulation, making sure that firms are looking to reduce their default rates, reduce their delinquencies, and seeing what innovations are come up with in that respect. So for example, in the UK, in, with Klarna, you can now freeze access to credit options. Um, and say, do you know what? I only want to be able to pay with money I have. I still want to use your app. I still want to use your shopping capabilities. I still want to manage my returns, but I only want to pay with money that's in my bank account, and you're going to give me 24 hours to unfreeze that. In um, Germany and Sweden, you can, um, 18 to 25 year old consumers receive a video straight away after signing up to explain that it's credit in a medium that they understand. Those are some of the innovations we think would, would precipitate if we look at outcomes based regulation. But you mentioned transparent data, and that's such an important thing that most countries aren't getting right. At the moment, we have private CRAs. The data is very out of date. It's very tough on consumers that if they are late on a 
you know, a $5 payment, that will affect their ability to get a mortgage. But we want effective credit information so we can make better decision making. So we are really, really supportive of national debt registries. We think they need to include all consumer data, all providers must feed into them without arbitrary three-tier systems or two-tier systems of hard and soft, um, where you can be penalized by being, you know, buying a pair of trainers and missing one payment on a $25 pair of trainers, and that affects your ability to buy a car or particularly to buy a house and, and in five years' time. So we think transparent national debt registries would be a very valuable thing, and they're in Norway, they're in the Netherlands, they work, um, if done right. So that would be some of my suggestions that we could be advocating for. Okay, so that leads me with my last question to the panelists, and you each get just 15 seconds because Bob's making evil eyes at me. Um, but imagine it's 2027 and we're back at the next Congress. Um, what would you like to see in place to protect consumers? Because I, I imagine that BNPL is not going anywhere. We're only going to see more innovation. We're only going to see it expanding to markets where they're not present anymore. But what would you like to see? in 2027, and you have 15 seconds each. So Delicia, you first. Oh man, put me on the spot. Um, you know, I definitely we would like to see uh, a federal consumer data privacy law um, establishing rights for individuals. Uh, thankfully, the CFPB has actually um, proposed a rulemaking. That's a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, in the, the U.S. So there's proposed rulemaking that has now been put out. But the right for consumers to manage their data and to correct, port, et cetera, um, is, is crucial. Um, and I think I've taken up my, my 15 seconds. So I'll stop there. I could say more. Thank you. Max? A sharp decrease in debt finance purchases in the e-commerce in Mexico, a cap on uh, high interest rates in Mexico, uh, and a culture of consumer protection in the uh, digital economy that puts the consumers at the center and not interest rates and payment rates and fallout rates, etc. Thank you. Yeah, um, an incorporation of the BNPL and similar products of credit into a overall framework for consumer protection that looks at customer outcomes as a key element, including elements of governance, which is key for products like this, and that lead to better usage of the services by the consumers who can get advantage of this. Uh, yeah. Access to safe, affordable, low cost credit with proportionate outcomes-based regulation. Um, definitely, and national debt registries, we'd love them. Thank you, and on that note, I'd like to thank all the panelists and the audience. Thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. I can keep asking questions, I probably will, over email. Um, but thank you, and thank you to Consumers International for this opportunity. Thank you.